at the store again bacon cheese look, we're gonna be look, soup look at the window what? What? oh my uh hey uh, hello. i'm just flying around telling people about uh, kids camp have you heard about it uh no where is it uh camp to hama july 8th through the 12th well that sounds pretty cool yes okay. it, it's gonna be awesome well i'll be there i guess excellent all right be courageous bye Hi everybody, it's Ollie. I just want to wish all the dads out there a happy Father's Day today and I hope you enjoy time with family this uh, afternoon and uh, also remember family camp, the deadline on sign up for family camp is Tuesday. I know there's uh, many people going, a good time of fellowship up in God's creation and also don't forget to start signing up your kids for kids camp. The sign up and registration is in the foyer. God bless you. Have a blessed day. So I fit right in up here in your country. Uh, but uh, my dad was a chicken farmer. So we had thousands of chickens. And uh, I grew up every day going out and feeding about 40,000 before I went to school. And one of the reasons I got involved in sports is so I didn't have to feed the chickens in the afternoon. <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, I'm very thankful for godly, godly parents. My uh, mom and dad, uh, they, they prayed for me every day of my life, uh, as long as they were alive. And my dad lived to be about 72, and he passed away. My mom lived to be 94. And uh, so I've, I've been blessed for many, many years having uh, parents who, who prayed for me and, and uh, lifted me up. But uh, it, it's just a wonderful thing to have Christian family. And if you have that, you are incredibly blessed. So, but uh, anyway, the ministry that the Lord gave me many years ago, instead of becoming a farmer like my dad, uh, God took me into the uh, into the pastorate and then eventually into uh, missionary uh, work. And, and over the years, I have traveled the world uh, training and equipping pastors and leaders. Uh, I've had the privilege of working in 53 countries now, training uh, uh, pastors and leaders in inductive Bible study. And every time we do the course, whether it's uh, overseas or I do it here, the, like this weekend we did a, a little inductive Bible study, people get excited because it, it's so powerful. Everybody needs to know how to study this book. But most people don't have a study system. Oh, you can read it, but how do you study it? And uh, this inductive Bible study is a very simple course. I, I put it together uh, years ago in the Philippines when the Lord took us over there and I began training pastors and I realized they needed a very simple system because some of these pastors I was working with only had a fourth grade level education. And obviously you gotta keep it simple when you're working with fourth graders. But I found that these guys could learn how to study because this inductive Bible study system is very, very simple. And if you've never learned how to, how to really study the Word, I encourage you to go through the, the course. It will open your eyes. It will revolutionize the way you look at this book here because this is the book of life. Amen? Amen. And this book teaches us how to live our lives. And if we don't know what the book says, how can we live according to God's standard and God's ways. And so it's critical for all of us to know how to be students of the Word of God. So I've had the privilege of uh, teaching this course for many, many years in, uh, in many lands. One of the countries where we're seeing God do some amazing things is in Africa. And uh, we're, we're training hundreds of pastors. We have five Bible schools going right now for just senior pastors. And they'll come over the course of uh, three years. They'll come uh, five times for 10 days. And we input into them this inductive Bible study program. When they come out of it, these guys are teaching the Word of God. Well, we have over 1,000 churches right now in Tanzania alone where the pastors every Sunday are teaching chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And that's unheard of in Africa because most of them are into the prosperity doctrine and all their teaching is about, you know, how you need to give and, uh, and how the pastor needs to take from you. And uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty pathetic. But you see, these churches have learned how to get into the word of God. 
So it's, it's exciting. Uh, one of the exciting places the Lord has taken me into the Middle East, and I've had opportunities to work uh, with a, a lot of pastors in the Middle East there and training and equipping. And, and uh, uh, do you understand that there is, there is really a, uh, just a, a revival going on in the Muslim world today? Do you know that since 1961 to uh, 19, uh, 2000, uh, 2010, uh, over 50 years, there's been more than 10 million Muslims converting to Christianity. When I was uh, doing my seminar in Jordan, I had four Muslims sit in my class. And they went through the whole class with me. One of them has made a conversion, I understand, since I've been there. The other three are a little afraid at this point, but they've been going to this church for over two years now. And every, every Sunday they're hearing the gospel. They went through my entire inductive Bible study course. And uh, one of them said to me, he says, I know I'm going to invite Christ to come into my life soon. But he said, uh, we need to move away from our family first, because if I re receive Christ, my family is going to try to kill me. Can you imagine what that would be like? And that's what many of the Muslims are facing today is, is uh, death because they're following Jesus. And so anyway, it's, it's not easy to follow Jesus in some countries. We are so blessed here to have the freedoms that we do today. But uh, anyway, uh, pray for us as we train and equip. You know, I was just over in Liberia two weeks ago and had a tremendous time with about 75 pastors, training them. And, and at the end of the seminar, they were so thankful. And, and some of them came up to me and said, you know, nobody has ever taught us how to study the Bible. And nobody has ever taught us how we can teach our people the Word of God. And they were so grateful. So anyway, I want to say a big thank you to you guys because your church has supported our ministry for many years. And uh, it's been a, a real blessing to team up with you and so many other Calvary chapels that have been a part of uh, our ministry and training and equipping pastors over the years. It's been a, a thrill to to uh, serve Jesus in, in this way. So anyway, thank you guys so much for standing with us. Well, this morning I want you to take your Bibles and I'm gonna do what I love to do and that's I love to teach the word. And if you'll take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Peter, and uh, we're gonna look into uh, 1 Peter chapter three. And uh, we're gonna look at a text that speaks to an issue that really we're facing today. Because in that day when Peter wrote this epistle, the church was, was under persecution. Uh, Nero had burned over half of Rome and he blamed the Christians. And so there became great hostility towards the, the church. And, and many Christians were being uh, persecuted and put to death. And, and, and when you go through these times a persecution as a as a Christian, you you have a, a two ways to go. One, you can get very bitter, you can be very resentful, or you can trust the Lord and know that God is in control in spite of what is happening to you, and you can rejoice no matter what you're going through. And, and so that's uh, that's what Peter is writing about. You know, uh, you know, don't become bitter. Don't don't. Don't become angry with God because you're having to go through these really hard times. And through the history of the church, the church has been persecuted. Uh, Christians have been killed and put to death. It's nothing new. And, and so uh, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, the, the subject of living in a hostile world. Have you noticed how hostile our world's become lately? All you got to look is at the news and... Uh, we have such a love going on between our Congress and our president and uh, uh, just, you know, just so many crazy things going on in our world today. And the world has become extremely hostile and especially towards the gospel. We're seeing this hostility. Why is that? Well, it's because we're living in the last days, folks. And we know that the Bible has told us that in the last days, the enemy is going to pour out his wrath upon this world. And we're certainly seeing that today as the enemy knows his time is short and Jesus is coming back soon. 
And so this message that I want to share with you this morning is so important because we are living in a very hostile time. And uh, so Peter is going to address this issue and give, uh, give us some very important principles as we go through. And I want you to follow along with me now. Uh, first, uh, first Peter chapter three, we're going to pick up in uh, verse eight. And uh, Peter begins and he says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be, be courteous, be, uh, uh, and not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, a blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who loves life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, lips from speaking uh, deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord against, is against those who do evil. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, as we uh, divide your word this morning, uh, we again recognize the importance of your Holy Spirit coming and teaching us. And so we ask that he indeed would do that. He would speak to all of our hearts this morning. And Lord, not one person sitting here would not be moved by your word this morning, that your word would deeply penetrate each of our hearts. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. And we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, Peter begins with the word finally. And uh, those of you who studied epistles with me, you know, that's a transition word. And usually when you hear the word finally, you know the pastor's going to end his message. Uh, but uh, Peter doesn't end there. He goes on for two more chapters before he, he concludes his message. But he says, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous or humble. And so Peter begins uh, in this little section here as he's starting to wrap it up. And uh, uh, Peter, and by the way, as I go through this, I, I want you to notice how I go through it because I'm going to do it very inductively. And inductive Bible study has three steps. First of all, uh, you have to observe. You've got to get what, what the text says. And then secondly, you interpret it, the meaning of what it says. And then thirdly, you bring application. And that's exactly what I'm going to do as I go through this text systematically. And this is how I teach the pastors to teach the word of God, because the word then will speak for itself. I don't have to be the spokesman, but God's word will speak to you. And so Peter, uh, he, he tells us uh, several things about, first of all, having one mind. What is he talking about, having one mind? Is he talking about everybody giving everybody a piece of their mind? <laughs> oh, we like to do that, don't we, sometimes? But we're, he's talking about having the, the, the same mind that Christ had, the mind of Christ, how important it is that we have his mind. How do we get the mind of Christ? Well, we fill it through his word. And as we fill his word in our minds, we become more like him. And that's why I need to change. Every time I hear the word of God, it needs to move me and change me to become more like Jesus because I want his mind and I want his heart. And, and, and so Peter says that you would be of one mind having compassion. Oh, it's so important, folks, to have compassion today. We live in a world that doesn't have a whole lot. But you and I, as Christians, are to have this compassion, the compassion that Jesus had as, as uh, he looked out over the crowd and as this crowd came rushing to this area where the disciples were going to and they were going to be alone with Jesus and this crowd saw where they were going. They ran there ahead of him, huge crowd of people, thousands of people that he's going to feed, the feeding of the 5,000. Well, we know it was a lot more than 5,000 because there were men and women that also came. But, but Jesus, as he looked out over this huge crowd of people, he was moved with compassion. He really cared for them because they were so lost. And, and folks, you got to see people today with compassion because they're lost. As we look at our legislators and our government and, and you see how they're governing and ruling, you realize how lost they are and how much they need Jesus. 
and, and we need that compassion for them to pray for them and, and lift them up. And so he says, have this compassion for one another and love as brothers. We need to love one another. Amen. We need to let the love of Jesus share, uh, share with one another. Being tender hearted, he says, oh, we need to have that heart that's tender towards God and towards our fellow man. And then he says, be courteous or humble. And so what is Paul talking about or, or Peter talking about as he sums up in, in verse eight, these characteristics here? Well, he's, he's really talking about graciousness. Are you gracious? Are you a gracious person in the workplace? Or are you hostile in your workplace? You see, what the world needs to see is gracious Christians in the workplace. You see, are you gracious in your home, with your family? Why is it that some of the people that we are the closest to, we can be, sometimes be the most hostile to? You know, uh, I, um, my, uh, I've had a dear wife that we've, we've lived together now for 48 years, and, uh, and God has blessed our marriage with uh, four children, and uh, we have uh, 10 grandchildren, and I just had my first great-grandchild. And we got our second great grandchild on the way, you know, and it's pretty, pretty exciting. You know, God has really blessed our family. But, but you know, uh, my wife and I in these 48 years, you know, we, we haven't always gotten along. I, I know you're surprised, you know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we don't see eye to eye sometimes. And, uh, you know, my wife, she's much smarter than I am. And she, she really has a way of getting at me, you know. And so we're going back and forth, you know. And, man, she, she really got under my skin. And I, I was angry at my wife. And, and, and so my response was not exactly kind. I, I, I just spewed some venom, venom on her. And uh, right in the middle of this heated discussion, and I'm spewing venom on my wife, the phone rang. And so I stopped what I was saying, and I went over and picked up the phone, and it was somebody from my church, and they had a problem. And the tone of my voice totally changed. And I began talking to this person, and I was very kind, and, uh, and we talked through their issue, and then I prayed with her, and I hung up the phone, and you know what I did? I went right back at my wife again. You see, why is it that we save that hostility sometimes for some of the people that we love the most? And you see, God wants you and I to be a people that loves one another. And he wants you and I to be a people that, that are filled with compassion and love for one another. And so we must be gracious. And that's our first characteristic. Living in a hostile world, I'm going to share six characteristics with you as we work through our text this morning, how we're to live amongst all this hostility. And so first of all, we've got to be gracious. See, do your children see the graciousness of God in you? Does your wife, your grandchildren, what do they see in you? And then he says in verse 9, he says, Not revi uh, returning evil for evil, or for revi reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, a blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So what is Peter talking about here? Well, he's saying you need to be forgiving. And that's our second characteristic. You and I have to be willing to forgive when people come at us and say things to us and, and cause us to allow anger to come in our own hearts. And instead of returning evil for evil, we're to forgive. Uh, when we, uh, my wife and I moved to the Philippines, uh, we had a very amazing experience where um, uh, we ended up taking a little Filipino baby into our home that was abandoned, left for dead. And uh, this little guy, uh, I was actually driving on the road one day, and uh, 
going to visit a pastor and I noticed this lady beside the road and she was holding a little baby in her arms and I didn't think much about it and she was really upset but I didn't think, you know, babies upset any woman. And uh, so, you know, I, I continued on down the road and about an hour later I'm coming back after I visit this pastor and this woman's still standing in the road with this little baby and uh, she was crying and so I, I just pulled over and I could tell she hadn't got a ride into town and so I said, do you need a ride? And she said, yes. And she gets in the car, she begins to tell me this story of this little baby that the mother died in childbirth and, and the father was a blind beggar and, and uh, the only one that was left to take care of this baby was an 80 year old grandmother and she couldn't take care of him and the baby was dying. And this woman happened to be wandering by and this grandmother begged her to take the baby out of her house so it wouldn't die in her home. So she was standing out in the road and anyway, I picked her up and she told me this story and, and uh, she said, I don't have any money. I can't do anything to this little guy. And, and so I ended up taking the baby and I drove home and I honked my horn and, and I said to my wife, you, uh, my wife came out and I said, you won't believe what I've just brought home. <laughs> and I handed her a little baby and uh, we ended up adopting this little guy. He didn't die as they thought he would. He survived and, uh, you know, he just became an incredible picture of God's grace because we were all once like our little guy named Aaron who had no hope and no future. And that day the Lord brought me along the road to pick him up. And so this little guy became our fourth child. We came to the Philippines with three. We weren't planning on any more kids, but we inherited one more. And this little guy became very special to us. He became our fourth child. But shortly after we adopted Aaron, uh, there was a lady in the Philippines, for some reason, didn't like me. And she was going around and saying, you know, the Finfrocks adopted that little boy because they're using his picture in America to raise money. And so I heard of this, and as, as I was, I would get around and speak in a lot of different churches, and, and, and almost every church I was going to, this woman had been there, and she had already told them about me and what we were doing with our son. And every time I heard that story, I burned with anger. And, and I wanted so much to get even with this lady. I, I, I didn't know who she was. And, and I wanted to find her, you know, and I wanted to put my hands around her neck and kind of squeeze a little bit, you know, and shake it a little bit. And that was my flesh wanting to get even because she was hurting our ministry. She was saying evil things about me. And I'll never forget, after somebody had shared that with me uh, at a church that I was speaking at, and I remember the anger just burning inside of me, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to forgive her. You need to let it go. And I tell you, that was so hard because my flesh wanted to get even. But I knew I needed to forgive her, and I did. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'll take care of her. You don't worry about her. You just deal with yourself. And I, so I did, we forgave her. And you know, later on it just totally dissipated. But it, I, I just remember the pain uh, of going through that where people would, be, somebody was accusing me of something that I hadn't done. And, and so he says, we've got to be forgiving. And so first uh, we've, we've got to be gracious. Secondly, we've got to be forgiving. And then look thirdly at this quote that comes from the book of Psalms chapter 14. He says, for he, who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so Peter is quoting from the Psalms and, and he first says, if you love life and you want to see good days, he says, you've got to control this thing in your mouth, this tongue. Oh, this tongue. You know, if you just turn with me, just turn back a couple pages in your Bible to the book of James. All right. And uh, James has some rather harsh words regarding the tongue. James chapter 3 verse 5, and then down to verse 8. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, 
a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and of reptiles uh, and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poisons. Wow, what an indictment against this little thing in our mouth. And what this thing can do in destroying other people. And, and so uh, Peter uh, says, if you love life and, and see good days, keep your tongue, hold it, refrain from speaking evil and let, uh, let him turn away from evil and do good. And here it is, here's our next principle. Let him seek peace and pursue it. You see, if you will control your tongue and you're seeking peace and you pursue it, God's going to bless you. And again, as we live in this hostile world, the world needs to see Christians that are seeking peace and pursuing it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. God sees you. He sees me. And his ears are open to their prayers. Aren't you thankful that he hears your prayers as we cry out to him in the midst of difficulty? But his face, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, God's going to deal with those who do evil. He, he knows. And you see, he doesn't need you to deal with them. He will take care of them. You seek peace. You pursue it and let God take care of the evil that is around you. Every man is going to answer to God for how they've dealt with other people and how they've lived their life before God. And then Peter goes on and he says, and, he who, uh, and, who, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good. Now, nobody's usually going to hurt you if you're a follower of good, but he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. And so uh, what I want you to see as our next characteristic, our fourth characteristic is that we are, are, are to be courageous. We're to live this life with courage. We're not to live in fear. You know, fear cripples us. The enemy loves to give us that spirit of fear to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. And, and so we know that, that, that you and I must live courageously in this world. Uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget a trip I was taking uh, uh, where I was actually driving up to, from Southern California and Northern California. I was driving up towards uh, along the coast and, and uh, I was going to speak at a conference and as I was driving along this road, uh, yeah, I, I saw in the distance this guy standing out there like this. And uh, so as I got a little bit closer, I, 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 I saw that he had this black jacket on. He had chains all over it. He had a big beard and he had long hair. And, uh, you know, as I got close, I, I'm going, man, there is no way I'm picking this guy up. And, 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 you know, he, he just looked dangerous. You know, I was certain he had a gun or a knife, you know, tucked away in his, uh, underneath that black jacket. And, and uh, anyway, uh, as I got closer, all of a sudden, I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to pull over and stop and pick him up. And I want to tell you something. My knuckles on my fingers <laughs> turn white as I'm thinking about picking this guy up. And I tell you what, I was really afraid. And you know what? I got up to him and I just kept going. I disobeyed the Holy Spirit. And for the next mile, the Holy Spirit was pounding me saying, you disobeyed me. And so finally I pulled over and I turned around and I slowly went back down the road, all the way back down. I'm going, please, somebody pick that guy up. <laughs> And sure enough, he's still standing there like this, you know. 
And so I pulled up and I turned around and I came alongside him and he got in my car and I want to tell you, this guy stunk. And then as we're driving, you know, he, he pulled out a weed, he started smoking marijuana in my car. And I thought, great, he's going to get high and he's going to kill me. And I tell you, I really fear gripped me. And as I'm doing this with my white knuckles on the steering wheel, I heard a little voice say, I want you to share him, share with him, share about me with him, would you? And so slowly but surely, I began a conversation with this guy and we started talking and, and I started to share Christ with him. And the more I shared Christ with him, the more interested he became. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, at, at a certain point, I, I, I just glanced over him. I could just see a little tear coming down his cheek. And, and I, I said, w would you like to pray to receive Jesus? And he goes, I really would. And as we're driving, I led him in the sinner's prayer. And that day, he had a divine appointment with Jesus. He invited Christ to come into his life. And you see, that day, the Holy Spirit was prompting me to stop and pick him up, and I didn't want to do it because I was afraid. But God had a divine appointment with that man that day, and he wanted me to use me, and I didn't want to be used. And how many times we miss opportunities because we let fear control what we're doing. Now, after a while, I let the guy off. I have no clue you know, who that guy was. I never saw him again or met him again. I don't know who it was. It could have been Pastor Dell. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but God knows. <laughs> and you see, he wants to use our lives, folks. And so we're to live courageously. Well, Peter goes on. And he said, but sanctify, verse 15, the Lord God in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so you and I are going to be, we must be ready to share the gospel. You and I are to be ready to share the hope that lies within us at any given time. And so whenever those opportunities come, we have to be ready to share the gospel. You know, uh, so often uh, we're, we're not ready to share that message. And I'll never forget a story a pastor told me in the Philippines about, uh, uh, he said that he, this pastor was going to Manila to speak at a, uh, at a conference. And he said that, uh, uh, he was one of several speakers in Manila, and uh, one of the speakers was a general sent down by the president of the country, Cory Aquino at that time. And uh, he said, when that general got up to speak, I could tell right away he wasn't born again. He was speaking to about 400 pastors, and the president had sent him to communicate some things he, she wanted to communicate to the pastors there at that conference. And and so uh, anyway, uh, my pastor friend said, as this general was sharing, the Holy Spirit began to speak to him about going up and sharing the gospel with him. And, and he said, you know, I, uh, 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 immediately I heard this little voice that's saying, who do you think you are? He's really an important man. You know, no, nobody will, he won't listen to you. You know, he'll never even give you an audience. And, and, and so this uh, pastor said he just really struggled, but he, he knew he was supposed to do it. And at the end of the, the evening, uh, he said, I, I decided to obey the Holy Spirit. And I walked up and, and, uh, and I started talking to the general. And one thing led to another. And I began to share the gospel with this general. And the more I shared it, he became open. And he said, uh, I, uh, I, finally, I said, General, would you like to pray to receive Jesus? And he said, this general said, yes, I, do, I would. He said, I, this is what I've been looking for. And, and right there, he said, he led him in that sinner's prayer. And that general became a born-again believer that day. And he walked out a saved man. Well, uh, that general uh, 
one week later, was asked to, by the president to go to a mountainous area to negotiate. This guy was a very good negotiator. And, and there was a real hostile situation that was coming up. And so he was right in the middle of negotiations. And everybody got angry inside. And somebody pulled out a gun. And bullets were flying around the room. And one week after this general had received Christ into his life, a bullet went right through his heart. He died instantly. And, and, and I thought, what would have happened if my pastor friend had been disobedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit? You see, this man would have gone to eternity without Christ. And do you understand how important it is that we obey the Holy Spirit when he prompts us? That we have to be ready to share the hope that lies within us because we never know when it's going to be somebody's last opportunity. And so you and I must be ready and then uh, lastly, uh, I want you to notice what he says in verse 16 and 17, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. You know, if, if, if you do evil, you deserve punishment. But if you suffer for doing the good thing, that's, that's okay. But, but he says, you've got to have a good conscience. And folks, it's so critical for you and I to deal with that conscience that's inside of us. Because when we do what's wrong, you know immediately what speaks to you. You know when you've done something wrong because your, your conscience will speak to you. And when my conscience speaks to me, I know I've got to deal with it. And, and you see, when, when, when I was accused by that woman in the Philippines of using this boy to raise money, my conscience was clear because I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. And you see, when our conscience is clear, it frees us to minister. And you see, you must minister with a clear conscience. And if your conscience isn't clear, it's going to hinder what God wants to do in and through your life. And do you understand, we must live every day. We have to deal with that conscience because God wants to use you. And if your conscience is not clear, it's going to hinder the work of God. And so uh, Peter gives us six very important characteristics of a believer. First of all, in verse 8, we're to be gracious. Secondly, in verse 9, we're to be forgiving. Thirdly, in verse 11, we're to seek peace and pursue it. And fourthly, we're to live courageously in verse 14. Verse 15 tells us that we must be ready to share the hope of what lies within us, the gospel, the good news. And then lastly, we have to have a clear conscience. And folks, we need to follow Jesus. The world is looking to see Christians that live differently from the rest of the world. And what does the world see when you go to work tomorrow? Are they going to see Jesus? Are they going to see more of the world in and through your life? And you see, our lives are open book, the Apostle Paul tells us, being read by all men. And, and, and what are they seeing? What kind of a gospel are they seeing in you? Are they seeing the hope of Jesus? Or are they seeing more of the world? So I want to challenge you today that your lives would be those that would be used mightily by Jesus Christ in these last days. I don't have to tell anybody here that we are living in the very last of the last days. And this world is not going to get any better. It's going to get worse and worse until Jesus comes and restores order. And I'm looking forward to that day so much when I'm going to be able to see Jesus and I'm going to be again together with my family, my loved ones, my father, my mom, one of my youngest sons who passed away. You know, I, I'm so looking forward to being with Jesus someday and uh, rejoicing and being in his presence forever, living with him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning and for its reminder of how we're to live in this world. Lord, we thank you 
that we, uh, you've, you've given us clear instruction how we're to live our lives. And Lord, I just, I just pray for each and every one here, Lord. You know what everyone here is going through. There's every one of us, Lord, you, you know intimately that you're, there's nothing that we can hide from you. And Lord, you know what everyone here is going through in their lives, even at this very moment. And maybe some are going through some really hostile situations. Lord, we just pray that you would help our brothers and sisters that as they go through this, they will trust you, that Christ will be seen in and through their lives. Lord, uh, Lord, we know that uh, uh, we, we can't pray to get out of this situation, but Lord, we ask that you would help us to go through it. Give us the boldness. Give us the strength to go through these trials and difficulties and hardships that we go through in our lives. And so, Lord, I just pray for your touch upon your people and that you would strengthen them, Lord. And if there's any uh, special needs today, Lord, Lord, would they not leave until they've prayed with a brother or sister? And, 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 and Lord, we just pray believe that you're going to bring deliverance even this very day, this hour, because you're a God who hears and answers prayer. So Lord, bless the church here. Lord, use them mightily in these days now. And so we just commit this time to you in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you all. So Pastor Dan's going to be out in the foyer. You have some questions for him. You want to visit the product table and, and see what materials there are for you to be able to use. We have uh, prayer partners on the left and the right here for you to come and uh, be anointed, pray for your situation or for uh, sage counsel. And uh, so we want you to have that uh, spirit of Christ upon you as you go out today. Have those conversations, divine appointments. Tell somebody about Jesus. Take one of those little invitation cards we have and invite somebody to church. Bring them with you Wednesday or Sunday. And so we uh, are so grateful to have Pastor Dan with us today. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Uh, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You're dismissed.